Hey, I hope you're having a good week. I, I hope you are encouraged. We're excited that you took some time out of your weekend to be with us. If I've not had the chance to meet you yet, just know that um, I'm excited. I'm new here too, so it's a good time to be new because I don't know anybody. I'm, I'm getting to know people. I'm standing at the door every week just telling people, hey, and making them walk past me, and they're freaked out. I don't know why. I don't, it's pretty great. Um, if you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're in a series called Rise of the King, Rise of the King. And it's looking at this theme that starts in the Old Testament that brings us into the New Testament with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who comes on a sleepy night in a little town called Bethlehem with no renown and no parades and no gold and no uh, big stuff being presented. And really the world changed the day Jesus was born and the world didn't even know it. And a lot of times God, when he begins a work, does it underneath the surface, and God is already doing some significant change in your life perhaps, and you don't even see it yet, you don't even know it yet, but the change has already begun. And so we want to look at this theme of a desire that is expressed in 1 Samuel chapter 8 for a king, and it comes not in the form of a desire asking God to move, it comes in the form of a demand. And there's a difference, we're going to talk about that some this morning, there's a difference between I desire and have a, a, a desire in my soul, God, for you to move versus I'm demanding that you move in this time frame, in this way, in these details, the way that I'm expecting them uh, to happen. And so I, I want to look at that this morning, but we're going to look at this request for a king that comes out of the nation of Israel. We're going to look at two kings over the next three weeks uh, that we are get a lot of information on in First and Second Samuel. One king is King Saul. The other is King David. Going to have a lot of fun talking about King David over the next couple of weeks. And uh, in that, that's going to lead us up to the Christmas season where we look to the king, Jesus, who came and gave Israel what no earthly king could deliver in this Christmas season. So uh, I'm going to jump right in. I've got a lot to cover today and excited to cover it with you. Uh, let me give you some background on this. First Samuel chapter 8, the first seven chapters have given us an account of the history of the namesake of the book's life. And so the first seven chapters are really uh, attributed to Samuel, who was a judge and acted as a priest and a prophet in many ways on behalf of the people of Israel. Uh, and it gives us kind of a story of his rise, his life, his background. Chapter 8 uh, signifies a significant change in Israel's history. We're moving from the season of judges into the season of kings. Now, during the season of Judges, there was one other dominant people that ordered Israel and presented a great security threat to them. It was the Philistines. Many of you are familiar with that because of Sunday school presentations of Goliath and all of that stuff. And so they presented a big threat to the nation of Israel, and that was kind of the looming threat around them at the time and the looming giant dynasty that lived around them. And during it, within Israel, it was a time of a lot of drifting, uh, meaning uh, not in chariots, like drifting your chariot, or cars, uh, sorry, pastor joke, instead, it was a time of drifting from God, we would come and, the people of Israel would present themselves before God, they would make this great, uh, profound, outward profession of trust in God, and then they would drift away from God, and that's because, and this is a core principle I want you to learn, as human beings, we are constantly worshiping something, so the question is never, am I worshiping? But what am I worshiping? I've had plenty of people tell me that they love God, they worship God, but they're just not expressive about their worship of God because they're not an emotional person. That's a lie. You're emotional about some things, it's just not as emotional about God as those other things. And what I mean is, yesterday, if your team was um, that team that looks like a turkey, and they had scored that third touchdown of the first half, you didn't sit there and go, well, the boys seem to be doing really good this half, I hope it continues. No, you expressed joy, exuberance. You worshipped. Uh, whenever you're single and you set your mind to not being single anymore, you sign up and pay money to uh, sometimes online internet things that are going to bring you people and then spend hours assessing the profiles of are they lying, are they telling the truth, swipe left, swipe right, trying to on a mission change that relational status. And if you're not careful, it can become something that you worship. A good thing that you put in God's place and give a lot of attention, affection, and time, and money, and energy to. So don't tell me you don't worship. The question is not do you worship, but what do you 
worship? And that's a question that we should consider from time to time in our own lives. What are we bending a knee to? What are we giving assent to today? Now, during the time of is uh, during this time of First Samuel chapter eight, we're told in Judges twenty one that this was a time that there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's what I call today high school. There's no rules. There's just suggestions. There's no truth. It's just your truth, and you just do whatever you want, and then you get this uh, generation that we are responsible for raising. I'm not putting it on them. I'm putting it on us, and because we do not worship God greatly or model that humbly to the next generation, we have a generation growing up going, well, we've got to figure it out. What are we going to do? What are we going to worship? So they worship till we find a God worthy of our time, worthy of our affection, worthy of our energy. We give our time to it, and if it's not the God of the Bible, it ends up under-delivering and over-promising. Does that sound like a political candidate you've heard lately? Overpromise, underdeliver. Going to do this, and then you look at the track record, and it's a mixed bag of results of what actually happened. And that is a sign of any God that cannot sit in the seat of the God in your life. There's plenty of gods that want your worship. They want your time, your attention, your money, your focus. They want your uh, wholehearted passion and your energy. But what happens when you don't have the true God who needs nothing from you is you find an idol that has to take from you because that's the platform that it's building its platform on. God is not a man for which you should boast, according to the Bible. He is not a man for which you should lie. He doesn't need to pound his chest for you to pay attention to him. He doesn't need to tell you he's God for him to be God. He doesn't need anything from you to make him God, which makes him God and worthy of worship in our lives. And so it was a lawless season where everyone did whatever they wanted. And what happens is Israel comes demanding, not deferring to God, demanding a king on their terms in their time for their plan so they can look like everyone else. And as as a result of it, what they get What they get is baggage, and that's what I want you to see today. Whenever you demand from God in your time, your way, your will, what you end up with is not freedom, it's not sufficiency, it's not something that satisfies. You end up with a king in the baggage, a king in the baggage. 1 Samuel chapter 8, read this with me. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel And Abiha, his oldest sons, which were names of faith. Abiha meaning father. Uh, Joel meaning, I think I wrote that down in my notes somewhere. Joel meaning Jehovah is God. So you have a father who is faithful to God, who raises his sons to know of God and to see God through his example. He's not the kind of dad that's distant and doesn't set a good example for his children. Samuel was a man of integrity. We know that according to Scripture. Samuel loved the Lord, served the Lord, yet he raised sons in spite of his example and in spite of his... uh, uh, setting that example forward that did not follow in his way. And that's what we're going to see in the story. Look at it. It says, Joel and Abiha, who were named after faith, came from a lineage of faith. His oldest sons held court in Beersheba. Beersheba was the southern province of Israel that bordered where the Philistines were. And out of respect for the Philistines, or out of respect for Israel and Samuel, uh, the Philistines didn't invade during this time. They stayed on their side, but there was tension growing at the border. You tracking with me? But his sons were there. Samuel was uh, serving as a judge and as a a prophet and priest over Israel. And so the the Philistines stayed away during this time. But we learn this in verse 3 about his sons. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Let me encourage some of you parents out there. You love the Lord. You've served him well. You've set a good example by God's grace that Satan's beaten you up over because your kids currently have strayed from or are not walking in the faith. And I just want to encourage you that you can be a great person of God, a great parent who loves your children with the love of God, and still get bad results. It happens to Samuels, and it happens to you today and other people today around our country. And so we don't, at the end of the day, we do not answer for what our kids decide to serve as God. We do answer for the example that we set before them of who God was. So own what you can own, but don't own stuff that you can't own. It's their profession of faith that they have to make. It's their God that they have to choose to serve. It's our job not to be a uh, person who puts obstacles in the way of them meeting God. It's our job to worship God wholeheartedly in a way that they can see God in our attitude, in our demeanor, in the way that we love them in grace. It's our job to hold out hope on the promise of God that if you train a child up in the way they should go when they are old, they will not depart from it. But it's not your job to deliver the promise. God delivers the promise. And at the end of the day, there is a moment where by God's grace, we've worshiped God, served God, and been an example of who God is to our children, and we now have to trust the work of God in their life just like your parents had to trust the work of God in yours. No matter the legacy that you set, no matter the background or example you've given. 
Are you tracking with me? So Samuel has uh, given a godly legacy down to his sons. His sons are not godly. Instead, they accept bribes. They're greedy for money. All this is given in detail in verse 3. Verse 4, finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. So the elders get together. They see this looming date coming where Samuel will no longer be in leadership. And by default, these unrighteous sons would be in that day leading Israel. And they're like, we got to fix this now. Now here's what you need to know. Samuel's not dead. Nor is he sick. Nor is he on his deathbed. It's a future uncertain thing to come that in the current moment doesn't look good. But instead of allowing time between the, the day of that decision in Samuel's transition and God's work in his sons or in whatever his plan would be to be revealed, they want to deliver a plan that they can bank on other than God right now. You see, it's, it's important to know the difference between a decision that needs to be made today and a prayer request that needs to be considered for a season and time right now. God's invitation to you and I is that we would seek him. Seek and you will find. That season of seeking is not 10 minutes sometimes. That season of seeking sometimes is months, sometimes it's years. And if you're not careful, you can start making decisions for things that are in the future that have not come to a point of decision in your life. And instead of seeking God, you can start trying to make a plan that you present to God. And God's not looking for your blueprints on how to run the future. I mean, the commandment is do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink. For t- today has enough worry in and of itself. God owns tomorrow. You can trust him with your tomorrow. So stop trying to make decisions for your future that God's not asking you to make right now. Instead, embrace the fact that there are times in our lives where the best leadership is doing nothing but waiting, praying, and listening for God to move. This is a big problem in my life. It's a big problem in many Christians' lives. You see, our hearts and the hearts of the elders of Israel often will drift from God, and we won't catch it until it surfaces, until the implosion happens. You're still going to church. You still read a Gideon's Bible once last week, right? You watched some TBN before you went to sleep. Terrible idea. And then all of a sudden, life implodes, and it's like, what happened? And what was happening is below the surface, your heart was drifting, and you never knew it. And it surfaced, and when it surfaced, the reality sets in that a long time ago, you slowly started drifting from God, making decisions that weren't dependent upon God, uh, making demands of God instead of deferring and trusting God. And as a result, now you've come to this point where your own destructions come by your own demands, by your own expectations, by your own worry and stacked up plans and agendas that you put on yourself that God never put on you. And you look around and go, how do we get here? Well, there's two things that surface our hearts. One is an uncertain future with change. Change. Now, we love controlled change. Like, I knew that, like, I like, I'm going to paint that wall that color. Like, that's controlled change. I went and looked at a color scheme, painted on the wall, looked at how it dried. My wife and I debated it. She gave me the green light. I went and bought the paint. I knew what the result was going to look like before I ever started because I had sampled. I had already looked at some other options, and I made sure that this periwinkle was the best decision for my wall. That's controlled change. What we don't like is unexpected change. Now, here's the problem. God said you cannot please and honor him if you do not walk and live by faith, which requires a trust in change that is not in your hands. It's not in your hands. Meaning there's going to be times where you didn't expect it, but God's not been thrown off his throne. And there's nothing going on in 1 Samuel chapter 8 where God's like, oh me, what am I going to do? He's he's not shocked that a transition is going to have to happen. In fact, if you study scripture, what you'll learn in Deuteronomy is God knew there was going to come a day where they would request and need and want a king. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 14 says this, and it lays out a job description for that day when this transition comes. 
Look at what it says. When you come to the land that, your Lord, that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. We'll talk about why this is not a, the elders coming and saying, give us your king, God. This is a demanding thing in just a minute, but look at it with me. He lays out a job description. One from among your brothers, you shall set his king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses since the Lord has said to you, you shall never go back that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself. Now keep in mind, there was no printing press, there was no mass production of books. If you owned a book, you were a baller. You owned a sh- like, like cribs back in this day would be like, look at my books. Because someone had to transcribe and write every bit of that down. So only the wealthy and the rich had a copy of it. And if you're a king, you're in such a position of influence that you need to know the law of God so intimately that you're going to write a copy of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy for yourself. And look at what it says. Uh, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he should write for himself in a, in a book a copy of the law, approved by, look at this, the Levitical priest. You're not going to edit it. You're not going to take out parts that hinder you from doing whatever you want. Instead, you're going to know the law of God, and it shall be within him, and he shall read it, uh, read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words. Some of you, God wants to give you a great platform. But the problem is you've yet to learn the fear of God. You've got great influence, but you have underdeveloped character. So your competency can get you in places that many people will never go, but your character will get you kicked out of there as quick as you came. And we see this over and over again. People of great competency who do not have the character to back it up, who rise on a platform where they end up finding themselves in extremely morally compromising positions because their character couldn't cash the check their competency got them into. This is not God's plan for the king that he would put over them. We know that this is ultimately something that God desires because he's going to bring through the line of David a king named Jesus whose government will only increase, who his peace will increase, and he will be king of kings and lord of lords, the one reigning, ruling, and returning that we look to in this Christmas season and celebrate. So learn the fear of God because you're going to have a great platform, because it's going to require a dependency, a deep neediness by that king who has the opportunity to think to himself, I don't need God. I mean, that's the dangerous thing with some of you. You're so competent that you could think, I don't need God. I mean, let's be honest. You don't struggle with where your next meal is going to come from, the majority of you in here. You don't struggle if you're going to have a roof over your head. Uh, You make plans for the future with certain certainty that you're going to actually walk into that future. We we don't really have a culture that sets up a desperate needing, dependingness on God in our daily life. Therefore, for a lot of us, it's easy for our heart to drift whenever we see change coming and we think we just need to be good stewards When in reality, it could sometimes be a cover, good stewardship of being a control freak that doesn't defer to God, instead makes demands of God. So the job description is being laid out for what this king would look like. He'll fear God by keeping all the words of his law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted above his brothers. This king will not love money, love greed, uh, be infatuated with lust and the uh, attainment of more. Instead, the king that God desires to give would be a king that is self-sufficient, is a servant king. He's the kind of king that will be amongst his people. Sound familiar with any Christmas themes? Emmanuel, God near us, God in a castle around us, no, God with us. And that's the profound thing that comes in the Christmas message. It's that God's not in a green room distant from his people. God comes and walks amongst us, lives amongst us, loves us, was touched by us, uh, was, was a person that, as a result of the crowd, smelled like the crowds. And that's, that's the way shepherds should work. We're not celebrities. God doesn't need celebrity preachers. God doesn't need us to, another person with a big media platform. Forget that. I want to be an accessible 
shepherd. I want to smell like, look like, and walk amongst the people that God has graciously asked me as an under-shepherd of him to lead and serve. And I can't do that from a green room. And I can't do that being a celebrity. Look, I'm not telling you I'm going to be your best friend. But I am telling you I'm going to be at that front door after, after every service. And if there's something going on in your life, I want to pray for you because I want to be your pastor. If there's something that's, that's, that's got you in a big state of worry or a broken state, I may not be at every birthday party, I may not be at every baby shower, but let, let me be very clear, let me be clear. I, I, I count it an honor to be your pastor, an honor to serve in the shadow of the great servant Jesus. And if he came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, I've not come here to be served by you. I've come here to be a lead servant to you. That's a sign of good leadership. May my arrogance be something that the elders rebuke me of and yank me out of this pulpit if it ever makes me in some kind of position where I distance myself from you and hide back in some green room and I don't shepherd and lead you. That's the way it works, guys. This is the job description that's being laid out for leadership in, in this case, for the king of Israel. That they would, their heart may not be lifted above their brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Now, now notice, there's a job description that's laid out. What surfaces our hearts, the first thing is change. And that job description is that this king, this king, will, be, will protect, model, and apply the law of God within the community of God. So there'll be a leader in applying God's word. They won't tell you what you should do, but they will model for you as they communicate it to you. One. Uh, they will be humble. They will be content, not a lover of money or stuff. This language carries over into the call of an elder within the church, and not a lover of money and riches. Uh, they will ensure that the priest and the prophets are free to hear and communicate the word of God regardless of cultural popularity or discomfort that comes from it. They will be a messenger of God, not an editor of God. Hmm. They'll tell you what you need, even if it's not what you want. Because there's a greater goal in mind other than current approval ratings or comfort that has to be in play at times if you're going to walk the path of God in your life. Are you tracking with me? So we get this job description that's laid out. And what surfaces is the fear of change and a lack of trust exists between the elders and God. And so they want a king now. They want a plan now. They don't want to live in faith and wait on the Lord. They want to live in sight and see what the Lord is doing before they commit to doing it with them. Are you tracking with me? The second thing that reveals our hearts whenever they're drifting is suffering. Or the potential of suffering. As they looked at the sons of Samuel, they realized that these guys are not good leaders. And under bad leadership, people tend to suffer. People tend to suffer. And we've all experienced that. The results of a boss that wasn't like Christ. The results of a leader that got their identity in their platform instead of their identity out of being a servant on the platform. We've seen this. It doesn't go well. And so they say, your sons do not walk in your ways. Give us a leader. Now, we've clearly pointed to the fact that in Deuteronomy, there was a promise that a king would come. So an argument could be made that the elders are simply saying, the Bible said we're going to get a king, why not now? And if their attitude was one of deference of saying, we, we see the transition coming, let's pray together, let's seek God together, that we may get an answer from God so that we could get the will of God and the purpose of God uh, for what he would have us do in preparation for that day in play. If, if that was their attitude, there's nothing wrong with anything that's happening here, except for a few things that are actually happening. Number one, this is the elders of the 12 tribes. They're spiritual leaders of their tribe. None of them have fasted. None of them have prayed. None of them have sought God. They've just planned. They just made a plan. And they're not coming and asking Samuel. They're demanding of Samuel that they receive a king. So the 12 tribes come, verse 4, it says, Find the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge over us like the nations have. That's a demand. That's a demand that's being made. They were determined to have a king. 
You see, the problem is Israel came demanding, not deferring. And this is a tension that we all walk in. Let me be very clear. God desires that anything that is on your heart be a request that's made known to him. If it matters to you, it matters to God. Okay? Very clear. Within that, there's still this this tension of presenting your request to God and then deferring to his leadership because he is God. So I come and I present to God, God, I don't want to be single no more. I would love to get married. God, I don't want to be broke no more. I would love not to be broke. God, I don't want to be in this job anymore. I would love a change of jobs. God, I, I, whatever it is. And God's like, yes, bring it. The problem is you can get to a point like the elders of Israel where you've already thought it through and made a plan with the guys and gals before you ever bent the knee and prayed and fasted and sought God on it. And you're not coming looking for input. You're coming looking for execution of your plan. So it goes wrong quick because what ends up happening is if you don't get what you've demanded, and this is how you know it's been a demand, you stop worshiping, you stop waiting with faith and expectation, and you begin looking for other gods that will serve and give you comfort so that you don't have to suffer. Hmm. You see, they were determined to have a king, yet they had not even consulted with God. And it's not until you get down to verse 6 That Samuel, look at what it says, was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Samuel doesn't like what he hears, but he doesn't come back and go, you you dummies. Trying to say the word idiots, you idiots. He doesn't yell at them. He first starts with, I don't know whether or not God's in this or not. Let me go for you and see if God's in it. So he defers to God. Look at what God says in verse 7. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They do not want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from the land of Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. You always worship what? Something. You always worship something. It's jumping off of the page. You always worship something. They stopped worshiping God, but they didn't stop worshiping. Some of you are in a dry season and you're not worshiping God, but you're worshiping something. And I'm pleading with you that whatever it is that's giving you temporary comfort, whatever it is that you think will make you have a more satisfied life that's apart from God or outside of God, it's going to under-deliver. It cannot be God for you. And part of this refining process of waiting that God calls us into is a season where our roots run deep and our confidence grows great in the ability of God and the unseen spaces of our life. After all, that's the only way that we please and honor God. I brought them from Egypt. They have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way the king will reign over them. Meaning... I'll give you what you want, but it may not give you the results that you think it's going to give you. Be careful what you ask for, because there are times when you make demands, and God, as a sign of his graciousness, lets you have what he knows will not satisfy you. And you get to the end of it, and you went from asking and pleading and going, God, i got to have it, to going, God, take it away. I can't tell you how many times people rushed in their singlehood the dating process compromise their integrity and their values because, you know, his first name was Luke, last name was Warm. But you were going to make them righteous. You were going to make them more like Jesus because there's just not many men of God around. No, you're not looking for men of God, you're looking for a man of God. And not to get too crude here, but I mean, many of you, if you know the story of Ruth, start with looking for a Boaz and then you end up with a version of Boaz that ain't Boaz. Bite my tongue. Sometimes his first name's broke and his last name is lying, deceiving. And then you go, and God, why'd you give that to me? And God's going, no, no, I'll let you have what you demanded. Just so that you would learn that outside of me, <laughs> there's no one thing that will satisfy you apart from me. So sometimes God gives you exactly what you want so you get to the end of it. And some of you, look, look, you're, you're smart, you're talented, you're cute, your britches fit, it's awesome. Um, and, you, and you in your 20s are like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to achieve, and you did. Yet there's still something broken deep inside of you and you know it. There's this, there's this discontentment that will never be satisfied and you know it. 
and God's letting you run down that path so that you look up one day, perhaps by God's grace, and go, something's missing. John Mayer, famous uh, musician, incredible guitarist, he wrote a song called Something's Missing, and he says, why, why is it everything that I hear I need always comes with batteries? I mean, that, that's the plight of life. That's what happens with Solomon. Solomon had everything you could ever want, yet he finds himself needing and wanting. So the request, here's the problem. The request is not a request, it's a demand. It's all demand, no deference. And for you and I, we can get, if we're not careful, into a season of life where we are making demands of God and not deferring to God. Jesus models the Christian life for us. When he's in the garden facing the most difficult of life, he prays this prayer. Lord, if it's possible for this cup to pass from me, Lord, let it be. But not my will, your will be done. What is Jesus doing? He's modeling for you and I deference. I would love to not go through that. I would love to not walk down that path. I would love for there to be another way for this to happen. But God, in the end, here's my request Your way is better, and I'm not just giving you a lip service around it. I mean it. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I know that your plans are not my plans. So, God, if your plans are greater than what you've allowed me to see, then your plan is what I want to go with because I don't want to settle for a substandard version of this, a a man-made situation where I make something of myself and then go look at God. No, I want God to move in me. I want God's best at work through me so that people look and they go, it has to be God in him and through him. You see, this is the challenge that Israel was facing. They want a king. They're demanding a king. And what's there is a lack of prayer and deference that's pointing to a clear sign of a drifting heart. Slap some scripture on it, make it Christianese, make it look the part, but at the end of the day, the heart's drifted and it's gone away. And the potential of suffering and the potential of change has revealed a heart that doesn't serve, love, or belong to the God who had delivered him. Man, I've been here. I've lived this story so many times where I've walked in what I hope would be the fruit of the Spirit only to discover the carnality of the fruit of the flesh. It wasn't love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, mercy, and self-control in my life. No, no, time revealed lust, discontentment, worry, angst, anger. And all that fruit was not pointing to the fruit of the work of God. It was pointing to the fruit of the work of a carnal man who was not deferring to God. How about you? A sign of God's work in your life is that you become more loving. I don't care how grisly and unemotional your father was. If Jesus is at work in your life as your heavenly and God the Father is at work in your life, you will be softened and be loving and be compassionate. Why? Because he's loving and compassionate and the spirit of God is at work in you to make you more like him. Stop making excuses for bad fruit and start planting different seeds. Mm. (laughs) stop making excuses for the bad fruit and start planting different seeds Mm. notice what happens there's a warning that comes at the end of verse 8 do as they ask but solemnly warn them about the way the king will reign over them. And then we get this synopsis of what's warned. What's warned is that he will take from your crops, he will take from your lands, he will take from your servants and people, and he will use them to build his kingdom and his stuff. And they go, we still want it. Because that's the problem with lust. It, it, it makes you blind to the warning signs that everybody else on the outside is going, this ain't gonna go good. And you're going, it's gonna go really good. I mean, we've all had that moment where someone else is doing something extremely stupid, and you're like, I can see it coming. America's Funniest Videos is a show that's run like 30 seasons off of people doing things that they did not see coming, where all of us are watching going, this ain't going to go good. And Samuel goes, this isn't going to go good, and they're going, it's going to go good. He's going to take all your stuff. Everyone loves taxes. But instead of relenting, they continue to move forward until you get to chapter 10. And this is where I want to close. I want you to see this. Turn chapter 10 with me. In chapter 10, they get to the point of anointing a king because they've demanded and God's going to allow them to have and experience the inability of a good plan made by man that's not blessed by God to be good. Because if the laborers labor without the work and blessing of God in their labor, it'll be in vain every single time. And in chapter 10, verse 17, look at what it says. Later, Samuel called all the people of Israel to meet before the Lord at Mizpah. And he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, has declared. I brought you from Egypt and rescued you from the Egyptians and from all of the nations that were oppressing you. But though I have rescued you from your misery and distress, you have rejected your God today and have said, no, we want a king instead. So let me be very clear. 
You're saying this will satisfy you, this will give you what you lack. But let me be very clear, you're getting exactly what you want. And I'm telling you right now, it will not work. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by the tribes of your clans. At some point, you would think the tribes would get together and go, this is a really bad idea. We should repent right now. But instead, they double down. Look what happens. So Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen by Lot. Then he brought each family member from the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord, and the Lord of the Matrites was chosen. Lord, and the family of the Matrites was chosen. And finally, Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. He was tall. He was handsome. He's going to look great in parades. He's going to make them blend right in with everybody else. They won't stick out at all, which was the problem with their request. So they found him and they, all right, look at what it says, uh, verse 21. Then they brought him, uh, yeah, 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 22. Let's go there. So they asked, uh, into 21. Let's just skip around some and be confusing about it. Saw the son of Kish was taken by Lot, but when they sought him, he could not be found. I love this part of the story. So they inquired again of the Lord, is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, behold, he has hidden himself amongst the baggage. Because that's what idolatry is. <laughs> idolatry is this thing that you think is going to work, and it ends up being something that's just baggage that you carry. It, it makes this statement that it'll carry you, but in the end, you carry it. You see, when it's God's will, it's God's bill, but when it's your will, it's your bill. And this one's on their tab. See, we got, we got sold on the idea on the internet that these were going to be one foot tall, and we had this big plan for decorations for them. And then we got them, and they're a solid six inches. It was so disappointing. Big promise on the internet, under delivery and the delivery. That's the same way many of us have lived with our idols. Big promise, just a little bit more help, just a few more days, and you're going to get it. You're going to fix this. No, no, no. God's hand will fix this. And until you put it in God's hand, you shouldn't expect any change because the definition of a fool is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And by now, you should probably know that the idol ain't coming through and it can't deliver you. It's dead. And it's just a weight that you have to carry. It's good news. There's a real king that came 2,000 years ago. His name was Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And he looked to a very broken people weighed down by their baggage and said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ooh, that's good gospel news for us. So who's your king? Are you making demands of God or are you actually deferring and trusting and waiting for God? You're worshiping something. My question to you this morning is what is it that you're bending your knee to? At the altar, we make this a point at the end of service for us to have an opportunity to stand up in our pride, leave it in its seat, and come down when the Lord's moving and say, God, I need to repent because I've made idols out of good things and put them in your seat as God things. And if that's you, I invite you to the altar this morning. Uh, for some of you, you're far from God. You've never heard the gospel, but somehow through the power of the Holy Spirit, as you've heard the word, you come to the realization that you need the God of the Bible to be your king and to be your leader. And if that's the realization you've come to, we want to celebrate that with you and lead you in what it means to put your faith in Jesus. And at the altar in the next few minutes, there'll be some people here to pray with you. And if you need to give your life to Jesus, I invite you to leave your old self and all of his brokenness and all of his baggage behind and by the blood of Christ rise in a new life that only he can give you as a free gift from him. Whatever it is that the Lord would have you do, I invite you to do it now as we stand, sing, and respond in Jesus' name.